Hey, Connor Nagenfeind here. I'm glad you are tuning in to this sermon or service. I hope it blesses you and encourages you in your walk with Jesus. If it does, you might want to share this resource with others, and you might want to find more resources on our website at edgewateralliance.org. There, you can also partner with us financially and help support the advancement of the kingdom through Edgewater Alliance Church. But I hope this sermon or service blesses you. Thanks for tuning in. Father, I thank you that you are a God who saves, that you see us in our brokenness, in our desperate need for help. You see us clawing in all different directions to solve a problem that only you can fix. I thank you that Jesus came, that he died for me and for my brothers and sisters. I thank you that Jesus is alive and that he's here now. Would you please kiss this gathering with your power and presence? And it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Can we give the team another round of applause this morning? Thanks, Ron. Thank you, team. Well, happy Mother's Day again. You moms, you all are incredible. You really are. What you do, it's amazing. I, I remember um, being in the hospital room with uh, my wife, who's just a wonderful mom, and, and she's giving birth to our first daughter, Chloe. And I'm there and I'm just witnessing this miracle of life. And it is so nightmarish. Really, I mean, it, disturbing, right? I mean, at least for me, I, I don't know. I think Claire might've been having a good time. I'm not sure. Um, we got a good kid out of the deal though. So it was worth the post-traumatic stress I have from that day. Um, but being a parent, it changes you, right? Like right away, it just changes your life. If it doesn't, it just is an indication perhaps that you don't understand what being a parent is because I mean, it, it changes the way you think about the future. It, it changes the way you plan, where you go on vacation, how you spend your money. It changes what's on your TV and the music you listen to. Although I will admit, I kind of hold the line on the music because kids' music is terrible. It's just, it's awful, right? That stuff should play in prison. Just baby shark. I don't know, it might solve some problems. I'm just saying. But being a parent really does change you. Uh, Matt Chandler and Adam Griffin in their book on family discipleship, they write these words. They say, being a parent is the most fun, upsetting, messy, beautiful, disappointing, and encouraging position in the world. Raising kids is an endlessly challenging adventure, and it comes with a never-ending list of responsibilities. If you understand the significance of the relationship that you have entered into when you become a parent, it should change your life immediately, and it should change your life for as long as that relationship lasts. You're changed forever, right? And so it is true with Jesus. You can't enter into a relationship the right way and ever be the same again. Your relationship with Jesus changes you. Which brings me to my thesis this morning is simply this, that Jesus changes people. And last week we saw what was perhaps the most surprising conversion story in all of the history of the church. We saw the conversion of Saul who would become known as Paul, right? He is the primary persecutor of the church that we are aware of on the face of the earth. He is like Sparky the dog trying to go persecute Christians, right? He goes to the high priest and he goes, hey, can I get letters 
to go to Damascus, which is approximately 135 miles northeast of Jerusalem. He's like, can you give me letters to the synagogues in Damascus that would ask their cooperation in me finding Christians and putting them in prison? And so he's asking for this quest. He's not told by the high priest to go on. He's asking, can I go do this? Can I go persecute the church? Caiaphas agrees. He sends the letters to the synagogues in Damascus. As you know, and if you missed the sermon, you can go back and listen to it. Saul is on his way to Damascus. He's nearing Damascus when Jesus encounters Saul knocks him off his horse. He's disoriented. He hears a voice from heaven saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? To which he responds, who are you, Lord? And it wasn't the answer he was hoping for. The Lord responds, I am Jesus, whom you are are persecuting. And he is a mess. He is a wreck. What we saw last week is that for three days, he's not eating. He's not drinking. He can't see. He is recognizing in this moment that everything that he had been living for was in fact a lie. That the very people he was persecuting were the people who were doing the right thing. He thought Jesus was a fraud Messiah. Jesus is actually the real Messiah. His life was pointed in this direction. He was pursuing this route when the whole time he should have been going this way. And God sends Ananias to Saul to help make things clear. He baptizes him. He imparts the Holy Spirit to him by the grace of God through the laying on of hands. And one of the things I want you to see is the change that happens right away. Picking up in chapter nine, verse 20, the text says this, and immediately, right away, he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogue saying, he is indeed the son of God. All who heard him were amazed. Isn't this the same man who persecuted Jesus's followers with such devastation in Jerusalem, they asked. And we understand that he came here to arrest them and take them in chains to the leading priests. The change that we see in Saul takes place right away. It's immediate. He comes to faith in Jesus. He's baptized. He hangs out in Damascus for a few days with Christians. And he's he's right away in the synagogues talking about Jesus. It, It was a persecution trip turned mission trip as he went to Damascus to imprison Christians. Now he's in those very synagogues, standing up and talking about why people should believe in Jesus. And as you can imagine, people are quite confused. People are quite disoriented because Saul had made the news. People were aware of who he was. If you remember the story with Ananias, when God was sending Ananias to Saul, he's like, oh, we've heard of him. We're we're aware of what he is doing. And in the text this morning, we're seeing people like, isn't this the guy? Like, isn't this the guy who came here to arrest us? Is this this? Yeah, it's the guy. It's the guy and he's talking about Jesus and the change we see in Saul is immediate and it's drastic. What he believed at the core of who he was, it changed. What he did with his life, it changed. His identity changed drastically and immediately. It's kind of like becoming a parent. You become a parent and your life changes, happens right away. But there's more. Verse 22, Saul's preaching became more and more powerful. This is significant for us in our time today. 
more and more powerful. And the Jews in Damascus couldn't refute his proofs that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. Why am I highlighting these words more and more? The reason is because these are progressive words. These are words that indicate progress, that increasingly Saul's preaching became more powerful. And so there's two things that I really want you to understand this morning is that when you come to faith in Jesus, you change drastically and you change immediately, but that is not the only change that takes place. You also change progressively. So I'll illustrate this for you. Um, who is this person on the slide? Maybe you know who that is. Who is that? You can talk to me. Tom Brady, right? Tom Brady in the off season of last year, he was the quarterback of the New England Patriots, and then he signed a contract with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And his identity as a pro football quarterback changed. He changed from being the quarterback of the New England Patriots and really the face of that franchise to becoming the quarterback of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the face of that franchise. And when did that happen? It happened the moment he signed the contract. Changed teams, got a new jersey, has a new identity. There's so much change that took place in that moment when he signed the contract, but he didn't have the Buccaneers playbook memorized. He probably hadn't met all of his teammates or the people in the front office. He, he, he didn't know what it meant practically and functionally day in and day out to be the leader of this team because it's going to be different. And so there was a progressive element to Tom becoming the quarterback that his identity already said he was. Are you following that? So in Christianity... When we come to faith in Jesus, the theological term is justification. It is a legal term, and it indicates that you are in right standing with God. That when you place your faith in Jesus, you get a new jersey. You switch teams. Your identity changes. And what's awesome is, is that God the Father sees you positionally through the lens of the perfect blood of Jesus, and he sees you as righteous, flawless, holy, and justified. Positionally, if you're here today and you're in Jesus and you're in Christ, that's how God the Father sees you. And that's awesome, right? Practically and functionally, are you perfect? Are you flawless? Are you holy? You got stuff, right? You got issues. So do I. You're like, Connor, we know. We're, we're clear on that. We're a work in progress. And what I love in, in Paul's journey is he writes about this and he's very clear on this. And he says in, in a letter years later, writing to the church in Philippi. He's reflecting on his own journey. And he says this, chapter three, verse 12 of Philippians. He says, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection, but I keep working toward that day when I will finally be all that Christ Jesus saved me for and wants me to be. No, dear brothers and sisters, I am, I am still not all I should be, but I am focusing all my energies on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. He's saying, I'm not perfect. I, I, I don't have it all figured out. But one thing I'm doing, I'm putting all my energy in trying to live up to the identity that I have been given by the grace of God of God. And that's all of us. That's all of our journey, right? I was um, speaking
speaking, my mother-in-law's in town and she was speaking with me between services. And she goes, I have this picture of you giving Chloe a bath. She said this to me between services. And, and it was actually a funny moment because I'm a dad. I, I love this child. I would die for this child. And I'm giving Chloe her first bath and I have like no idea what I'm doing. I, I am washing her so softly that I'm like barely getting dirt off because I'm worried I'm gonna break her. Have you been there? Like, this is delicate. I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. So I was this kid's dad, loved her. My identity changed. I'm her father, but I have had a lot of growth since that day she was born. And I'm gonna continue by the grace of God to grow in what it means to be a dad and what it means to be a parent. And that is an illustration for the Christian walk, right? That you've been given an identity in Jesus. You are a son or a daughter of God, the Father. And it is your privilege and your joy to continue to grow in that identity that you have until he calls you home. And one of the cool things that we see in the life of Paul is because most of the book of Acts now is really gonna follow his missionary journey and his ministry and what we see in his life in the scriptures, both in regards to personal holiness and in regards to ministry effectiveness is we see a trajectory pointing upwards and onwards. And the question I have is, can the same be true? Can the same be said of you? Is it true of you that the trajectory of your life is growth in Christ, of you living more fully, stepping more fully into the identity that you have already been given by the grace of Jesus. And we see that in, in Paul's story. And so uh, really, really in the very next verse, it's interesting because he has to face the uh, consequences of switching teams. In verse 23 of Acts, it says, after a while, the Jewish leaders decided to kill him. So it's the hunter now becomes the hunted and people want Paul dead. He has to escape Damascus. He eventually winds up in Jerusalem. And it's kind of humorous because the text says that the apostles don't even believe he's for real. Like they're skeptical that he is a fraud and he's trying to kind of weave his way into their ranks and then sabotage them. But, but Barnabas shows up on the scene and says, no, he's the real deal. Jesus has encountered Saul. Jesus has changed Saul. Saul has switched jerseys. He's changed teams. He's the real deal. And it might be a little bit humorous because instead of putting him to work in Jerusalem where the apostles are at the time, they send him home. So it's almost like, well, we're glad you're here. Why don't you go back home and do ministry there? And he, and he goes and he goes to Tarsus where he's from. And what we see over the book of Acts is that his ministry footprint just continues to grow. His effectiveness grows. His preaching becomes more powerful. The trajectory of his life is pointing towards Jesus. What direction is the trajectory of your life pointing this morning? Are you growing? It doesn't matter how old or young you are. Are you growing? I, 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 don't, I hope this is true. For you, I hope it's true collectively for us as a community of faith. But I want to love Jesus more five years from now than I do today. I want to love my wife and my kids better five years from now than I do today. I want to love people who don't like me and who are not very nice to me. I want to love them better five years from now 
than I do today. Five years from now, I want to have a more robust understanding of the scriptures. I want, I want to bless people more and preach better. I want, I want to grow. I want to grow. And it's interesting because, you know, Paul in his letter to the Philippians, he just got done saying that he's flawed, that he has issues. Again, Philippians 3 verse 12, revisit this briefly. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection. But I keep working toward that day when I will finally be all that Christ Jesus saved me for and wants me to be. I'm trying to live up to the identity that God has given to me. This should be motivated by a love for God and a recognition of his grace and his mercy and his goodness towards you. That should be driving us, right? So like a quarterback who just got a billion dollars to go lead a franchise, he's gonna make a lot of money whether he's really good or whether he stinks it up on the football field. But any person with integrity be like, they, they want me to lead this team? What an honor. They're gonna pay me how much to lead this team? That's awesome. I'm going to go out there and play my best. That example pales in comparison to what you've received in Jesus, what you've been given as your identity, not as some leader of a football team, but as a son or a daughter of the king. And if you believe that, and you believe that is the relationship you have entered into by God's grace, it should change you. It should change you immediately. It should change you drastically. And it should also change you progressively. It is something that you should continue to grow in. Not plateau, not decline, continue to press forward. Not perfect, flawed, all of us are. All of us have issues. I want this to be a place where, where you receive grace and you feel comfortable being like, I struggle in this way, I struggle in that way. Other people are struggling. But also a community of faith that pushes one another forward. So after he admits to his imperfections, after he admits to his flaws, he says something that almost comes across a little bit surprising because he just had a humble moment. He goes, I'm I'm flawed. I'm not where I should be. And check out what he says just verses later. Verse 17. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine. How often have you said that to somebody? That's a pretty big statement. Hey, pattern your life. You know how you live your life? You should live it like I live mine. That's a big statement. But it's married in the text to this humility of I'm not perfect. I don't have everything figured out. Pattern your life after mine and learn from those who follow our example. What's the example? The example is not settling in your faith. The example is refusing to take steps backward. The example is pressing on. In just a moment, we're going to close by, by singing a song together. And, and really the song is just a prayer of saying, Lord, I realize I've messed up. I've failed, but I want you to continue to work in my life. If that's your heart, I just want, I want you to sing with us and, and pray. And I want to remind you of something. That God doesn't send you out on this mission alone. He doesn't say just good luck being like me. He gives his Holy Spirit to his church. And the scriptures say that God is at work in us both to will and to work for his good pleasure. But God is a gentleman. And so he invites you to participate with him. He invites you to receive the work he's doing in your life. He invites you to listen to him when he instructs you and says, follow me in this area. Trust me in this. Start doing this. Stop doing this. He's good. His plans for you are good. But I believe there's some of us in this room today. If we're being honest, and I'm not here to judge you, I want to love you, your faith isn't growing. It's plateaued. You look at your life and you're like, I don't know if I'm any closer to Jesus than I was five years ago. Jesus wants that to change. 
Maybe there's an issue in your life, a singular roadblock that you keep hitting. And today you need to lay it at the feet of Jesus again. Say, Lord, do what only you can do. I'm ready to respond. I'm ready to grow. At this time, I want to invite you to stand as we worship together. A thousand times I've failed, still your mercy remains. I should stumble again Still I'm caught in your grace Everlasting Your light will shine When all else fades Never ending Your glory goes beyond all fame purpose remains the art of losing myself bringing you praise everlasting your light will shine when all else fades never ending your glory grows beyond all fame in my heart in my soul Lord, I give you control, consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise become my embrace, to love you from the inside out, everlasting. purpose remains the art of losing myself bringing you praise everlasting your light will shine when all else fades never ending your glory goes beyond all Now, Lord, we just give the rest of this wonderful day to you. We thank you that you are a God who changes us from the inside out, motivated, Lord, by your great love and your grace for us. May we not be stagnant, Lord. May we constantly be pursuing you. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.